What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you an inter-hiatus special edition of Block Digest on Wednesday, February 26th, with special guest Matt O'Dell from Tales from the Crypt. So, uh, what's going on today, Matt? What's up, guys? Uh, really appreciate you having me on. Long-time listener of the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, glad to hear that, and you guys do uh, some pretty good content over there yourself. Uh, so, no para. What's going on? That's uh, kind of a light crew today, just the, the three of us. <laughs> hey guys, we just hired the best shitcoiner in the space. <laughs> yeah, he wrote the Stratis protocol, but everything in C sharp, and he's gonna work with us for two weeks. And I'm I'm really happy to to learn from him. Wait, Wasabi hired Justin Sun? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I kind of said before we hit the, the record button, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to stop myself from commenting on the coronavirus, so we, we should just kind of get that out of the way to start with. Uh, so yeah, this this shit's uh, starting to get kind of fucked up, Matt. <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, the panic is is it just seems like it's the panic alone is going to become an issue regardless of whether or not the virus becomes an issue in America, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of already stockpiled like two months of rice and beans and some liver and shit. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say this is the point where you go get some food, like don't go nuts and buy like a thousand dollar, like prepper kit, but just like cover basics so you don't have to run out to the store if people around you start freaking out yeah i remember what you you told me that oh you already stocked up like last week and i thought that you're somewhat crazy but now i'm like i'm thinking of the same because it's here in italy and the shops are, and the stores are empty so maybe it's just just the best time to stock up for myself too the best time to prepare was yesterday the second best time is right now. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, like, it's, th th this is, this is just, like, this is the weirdest way that the, the economy could just start slipping down the, the slope that, that I could have ever imagined, like. <laughs> no one expects a black swan. True. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Matt, you know, if you, if you guys, uh, you know, were at the, Tales from the Crypt been uh, thinking about how this is going to start affecting things in Bitcoin land? I'm, you know, it's interesting seeing Bitcoin uh, fall so much today. Um, it just seems kind of just uncorrelated to everything that's happening. Maybe, you know, people just want liquidity. Um, but I know me personally, sats are my safe haven. So uh, it doesn't really matter what the price does on the short term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th this, I think, was just obvious. Like, if, if people are getting spooked that the market's going to respond to this, then they're going to start deleveraging their riskiest investments first. And I mean, it's like, I, I as much as I love Bitcoin, it, it's probably one of the riskiest things in most people's portfolios. It's going well, to be interesting seeing uh, how it affects uh supply chains in respect to hardware wallets nodes mining hardware stuff like that just, just quickly can you tell me how much it for because i didn't check it today i think, I think. we're what 8500 or something right now oh boy shit we got okay. the vegeta memes again yeah <laughs> Dude, I saw hodl earlier uh retweeted that that old tweet from the the shirt shore for that uh over nine thousand 
uh, shirt I made a little while back is just like, uh, not sure that's a valid meme anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's the, you know, the, the one thing I'm, I'm mostly concerned about is kind of like a, at the other end of this, because it's, it's right now the, the absolute last thing on the Communist Party's mind in China right now is probably Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining hardware. But when we get to the other side of this and things start burning out and getting back under control, I mean, it is undeniable that they're going to just maintain all, all of this checkpoint infrastructure, the, title, the tighter social controls that they've been setting up in response to this. And so it's like, how does that change the the security of the actual hash rate in hardware in China after that when things are calmed down and they start putting other things back on their radar? Yeah, I mean, we see this all the time. You know, authoritarians, they use uh, crises to further their power. I mean, look in America, we had the Patriot Act right after September 11th. Um, so it's, it's really important that people stay vigilant and uh, calm and don't just like give up all their rights you know regardless of where you're located mm -hmm. yeah i guess uh no part you got anything else you want to you want to chip in here i think uh <laughs> if we don't kind of shift topics soon i'm gonna i'm gonna start getting all alex jones about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's shift topics to alex jones <laughs> all right all right so i guess uh yeah you know corona aside the big reason we wanted to kind of bring matt on today was kind of dive through a lot of the, the privacy stuff uh, in the space as of late, particularly kind of the back and forth uh, between Samurai and Wasabi. And you know, it's, I think it's really nice. No par can be here for this, but the few times I have tried to reach out to people at Samurai uh, while trying to put something like this together, uh, either no response or not a willing to come on response. So, you know, I just do kind of want to put that out there that that door has been open. It's not like, uh, you, we're just having this discussion and they were not allowed to participate in it. But yeah, I think to start firstly, I kind of want to concentrate on the, uh, the kind of social side and dynamics of all of this. You know what I mean? I sure, Sure, no, you've seen me. I kind of lose my temper a few times on Twitter <laughs> relating to this topic, Matt. Never. Me neither. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, I, I kind of want to touch on four main kind of examples, I guess, to really go through this. And, you know, it's, I, I don't really want to call people out by name, but it's kind of hard to avoid that given I'm pulling a specific example of an interaction with people I've had. But, um, you know, it's it's kind of the core of it, I think, is just the way that Samurai engages in marketing. And the, the, kind of the first example I want to pull out here is how, you know, whenever the issue comes up of, um, one second, my cat, sorry, she loves to uh, push her way through any obstacle to harass me. But um, <laughs> pr pretty much like that they keep making a point of distinguishing that while their backend server that actually serves balance data to the users does receive the, the master pub keys for light wallet users, that the actual coordinator for the, the Whirlpool system um, never gets that information. And I, I've personally interacted with Samurai users who get into arguments with me over the, the privacy model on the network level for light users, um, cite actual Samurai team members making that comment and then deny that their backend server for balances even sees the master pub key. Like I, I've had to actually link people the line of code in the wallet where it sends that to the server. And it's kind of my issue with this specific one here is, is why do they insist on stating that the coordinator for Whirlpool never gets a master pub key? And that's completely irrelevant. It's the same group of people operating both the coordinator and the back end. Um, so the same entity has access to that information. You know what I mean? It's kind of a, a red herring 
to to say, well, this server doesn't get that, only this one does. They're both controlled by the same people. And I've directly interacted with users who were confused about exactly what information was or wasn't revealed to samurai servers because of this. And like you, you kind of see where I'm going, Matt, with how this the way they engage in marketing is spreading very big misunderstandings of how all this works. Well, first, I want to state that, you know, I'm not a part of the Samurai team. Um, I am a Samurai wallet user and I'm a Wasabi wallet user. Um, so I'm here in that capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, they, they're the the coordinator server and the back end server are separate. But if you're not using your own node, um, they have your XPUB. They can connect your addresses naturally. Um, the 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 real the the thing that they're really good about doing though is they do make clear the trade off that Whirlpool isn't designed to protect against samurai, regardless if you use a dojo or if you don't use a dojo, because it's trivial for them to sibyl attack the the pools because they don't have the the main the main resistance to a sibyl in this scenario with both Whirlpool and Wasabi is the actual the mixing fee. And if the entity who's collecting the mixing fee is is participating in a Sybil attack, then they don't even have to um, pay for it except for minor fees. So as long as minor fees are low, um, I don't really think Wasabi or Samurai protects you from the coordinator being malicious. Well, yeah, but it's it's not even necessarily about it being malicious. It's just the point of like yes they they openly say that and and they're clear about that but then on the other hand they make sure to always clarify you know the coordinator doesn't get this only the other server does when it's a it's a difference that doesn't make a difference you know what i mean yeah so if if you would be a wasabi coordinator how would you see bill attack well i mean you guys are already kind of doing it you remix you 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 enter the mix with uh your fee revenue, right? And then you end up paying yourself. So it doesn't really cost you anything. Um, if anything, uh, on Wasabi, wouldn't you have a higher incentive uh, to do this type of attack? Because it actually would increase your fee revenue um, because everyone would be paying for a perceived higher anonymity set than otherwise. Yeah, that's correct. But consider a couple of things here. First, in order to make this Sibyl effective, we need to have at least a lot of Bitcoins. So we can, <clears throat> we can match maybe not every users, but the majority of the users Bitcoins. Now in Wasabi, there are, let's say 40 Bitcoins go through one round. Now we have to provide 40 Bitcoin for after every single user. So that would be 40 multi, sorry, not, not 40. We have to provide, uh, let's say with 50 participants, 50 times as much Bitcoin after every single user. It's, let's say it's doable and we have the funds. Now th- there is the issue that it can be instantly noticed that this happened, or, or if not instantly, this can be noticed retroactively, right? And that's maybe something that we would not want to risk. And furthermore, there is the multiple, this, this is a general civil, civil problem that there is the multiple civil attack uh, issue that if there are two civil attackers, then none of the civil attacks are as effective as it could be. So anyway, the thing is that we would need a lot of money and it would be still noticeable. That's the, that's the, that's the thing here. Okay. I mean, it's like, you know, a civil attack from a central coordinator is, is something any of these systems are vulnerable to. But like my, my point here is, is the social ramifications of the way in which samurai markets, like this constant delineation that this one server never gets your public key only this other server gets the public key uh it's a a pointless distinction like no matter what samurai 
is getting that public key if you use a light wallet, like if you're not using Dojo. And I have interacted myself with users who, because of that distinction constantly being made, took that to mean that as a light wallet user, Samurai did not get their post mix pub key, period. And it's that that's kind of the core point I'm trying to make is the manner in which they advertise themselves is is kind of it's pointing out irrelevant things, a difference that isn't a difference. And this is leading to their users, you know, not not all their users. I know a lot, especially with privacy tools, a lot of the users in this space are very smart, but I have seen some subset of those users wind up with a completely off base understanding of what private information of theirs is being sent where and that's my chief problem here yeah i, I mean i it's it's i think it's a pretty much a pointless distinction um i mean i but i i, I don't think this is an issue that's uh specifically um you know specifically with samurai like we have pretty much every mobile wallet in the space uh is sending x pubs um at least they're using tor um, and at least they're saying that Whirlpool isn't designed or Samurai in general isn't designed to protect against themselves. Um, but I mean, if, if you use if you use some of the transactions and whatnot with your own dojo and you're using with a participant that's an own dojo, then they can't. Um, then it kind of works out and it actually works out better um, in terms of you can shield yourself from a Samurai. But that's the point, Matt, is, is I'm trying to make is on the, with one hand, they say, yeah, this isn't supposed to protect us against, you know, them. But on the other hand, they're constantly driving home this point in their marketing that leads people to believe, oh, but you are protected from us. Like pretty much Max Tannehill was the guy who, who denied that the postmix pub key was sent to samurai period and the reason he he thought that is because of this constant you know only our back end is getting that not the the coordinator like and, and that just being misinterpreted yeah i mean look i definitely i definitely agree that that more education needs to be put on that front um and i think that you know we need as many users running their own full notes as possible and i think that wasabi's solution for light users on a network level is extremely elegant. Um, but you know, you have limitations when you're running on mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I could disagree with that. That's very elegant. I mean, it works now, but there is this cheat because we are cheating there that we are only building filters for batch 32 addresses, which is just makes the filter size much smaller. And that's why the wallet feels light when it actually not that light. Uh, yeah i mean it's trade-offs where they're going to be but you know kind of shuffle along though with the because the, there's uh three more kind of things i want to point out in this i guess social aspect of things before we move on to the the technicals really but you know the, the next example i have is is not kind of just saying something vague that that is being misunderstood it's a samurai user actively lying um, so I think it was a December of last year, um, you know, while the, the whole plus token, um, mixing with Wasabi was, was a big public thing and everybody was looking into that and arguing over it. Uh, Keon Rodriguez, he's a samurai user and a big advocate for them, um, made a few comments pretty much claiming outright that bit club, the mining Ponzi scheme was busted because of using Samurai and because the privacy gained from Samurai, I'm mean, sorry, was busted using Wasabi and was busted because of mixing with Wasabi, not providing um, adequate privacy. And that's just an outright lie. Like if you look at the actual court filings for the, the bit club guys getting busted, it was purely they were on everybody's radar because they, they were a blatant Ponzi scheme in this space for years. Uh, they popped up on the DOJ's radar and they just subpoenaed their emails. And these idiots were openly committing criminal conspiracy in unencrypted emails. Like how they were caught had 
absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with wasabi or any kind of problems with wasabi. And he was a very active samurai user and advocate outright lying and trying to publicly make the claim that that is why they were busted. Can I ask you something uh, about this? Because I, I, I don't know BitClub, but uh, so BitClub is a miner, right? And at the beginning of Wasabi, when we started, there was someone who put 800 Bitcoin into Wasabi, which was a huge money, right? right? Like everyone was trying it out with 0.1 Bitcoin. We didn't even have the multiple denomination stuff. So the thing is, and, and then someone said, oh, this was a miner. Uh, he actually left very early on anyway. So 800 Bitcoin went into the mix uh, in two or three rounds, I don't know, or maybe for one day. Uh, is this the bit club thing what we are talking about right now? I mean, it could be. Um, I'm not really sure. But like, if you, if you look in the indictment for that case, um, their use of Wasabi had nothing to do with why they were busted. It, it was just they were publicly known and the DOG or DOJ subpoenaed emails. Like, it, it's that simple. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, um, I missed the Bit Club uh, takedown. But, uh, I mean, it seems similar to the plus token situation um, where, at least with the plus token, uh, my understanding is that they were using Wasabi in addition to other techniques, um, including self-shuffling. Um, and they were after Wasabi, they were combining their UTXOs. Um, so whether or not they were doing that on purpose or they didn't realize what they were doing, they were kind of um, accidentally sibling uh wasabi mixes um yeah. because when they combine them at the end it um you know reduces the end onset for everyone else yeah and you know the the plus token thing i mean that's that that happened in china so like i i at least personally am not aware of or aware of where to find actual legal documentations or even if they make it available in in the way they do in america that that arguably could have actually had something to do with the the mixing being inferior, but they were shoveling way more than Wasabi's throughput through there. And on top of that, being incredibly stupid post mix. Like I, I'm speaking specifically to BitClub. Like the reason they were arrested definitively had nothing to do with their use of Wasabi. It was simply popping up on the DOJ's radar and having their emails subpoenaed. So like plus token. The, the the dynamics are very different and that might have been a factor but with bit club it definitively was not and you have a massive samurai advocate running around claiming that it was like i think that is incredibly unethical and highly deceptive yeah i mean look i'm not trying to uh i'm not trying to defend specific actions by you know specific users um, yeah, and I mean, how Matt, they present, like, don't, present don't feel like I'm trying to put you on the spot. Like I'm not trying to, to kind of lay the blame at you. It's just like, you know, I've, I've wanted to kind of touch on a lot of this for a while now. And the reason I've been taking so long is just trying to figure out how to have a conversation in a way people will actually listen to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Look, I think all conversation is good. I think we need, you know, as much conversation as possible to help people learn. This is how the space improves. Um, Look, at the end of the day, um, the, especially these really big uh, criminal enterprises, like if you're moving large amounts of money um, just based on the volume and like timing analysis alone, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble covering your tracks, especially since you see with a lot of them, they use uh, fixed addresses that they attach to their crimes um, and they just practice really poor UTXO management in general, which is you know, symptomatic. It's across the space. Everyone does. Um, but for some reason, these criminals do even worse, at least the ones we know about. Maybe that's why. Um, so, you know, to put the whole blame on onto Wasabi usage when um, at least with with plus token, uh, that was not really the case. They were exposed regardless whether or not um, they used it. Um, seems seems wrong to me. But yeah, but but and I think Wasabi's been pretty good about not making 
too you know claims that were that were too big and and being like pretty um good about explaining the trade-offs which i which i think is important as well let let me close this conversation in short that i don't know if bit club or plus token ever used wasabi they probably didn't because they would be violating our terms and conditions and no one would ever do that right <laughs> so <laughs> so but the bottom of the story is assuming someone with a large amount comes into to to a mix it's like you know you can't hide an elephant between a bunch of children like that just mm -hmm. um i mean plus token definitely was using wasabi uh ergo's research was pretty great in that regard um they yeah, just didn't use it for uh... all their funds and they combined afterwards at the end um they probably used that select all button i think he's a little just a little bit of dry humor <laughs> but um now yeah, okay so two more of these uh to get through Sh shinobi's irritations <laughs> i'm just excited uh, for the implementation talk uh we'll, 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 we're, we're gonna get there all right so this next one is kind of a, a touchy issue because th this this is kind of something that it's just this is what the situation is but kycp um the the privacy uh tool or, or chain explorer to kind of uh, run boltzmann through different transactions and analyze things um so something i have a big problem with regarding this site if you actually dig through uh, a lot of things is boltzmann is only applied selectively and based on my going through things it's it's generally only applied on smaller transactions um which generally fit whirlpool but not other coin joins and you know um the, 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 I, I do want to say here that it's the reason for this is just how Boltzmann works. Like you're effectively going through all possible interpretations or combinations of inputs and outputs and, you know, assigning probabilities. So the bigger a transaction is, the more computationally expensive that is. And, you know, I, that, that is something I do get. But the end result here that I've kind of seen is you'll, you'll pull up a whirlpool coin join and everything's green maxed out statistics this is good very private and then you'll pull up um say a larger wasabi coin join or a join market coin join and there's just no boltzmann applied and everything's yellow there's no ratings it just visually in a visceral level is kind of deceptive because you're you're kind of giving all these thumbs up this is good to you know samurai's mixing tools but not even applying that metric to a massive amount of you know other types of coin join protocols transactions and you know again I, I get that it's the larger the transaction the more expensive that is and the people operating this ultimately have to pay for this so it's it's kind of like a, I, I get it and it's not really reasonable to expect somebody to just eat the cost for something like that but at the same time, it's constantly used to, to kind of sell how, you know, well performant Whirlpool is in comparison to these other things. Um, have you used it recently? Um, not, not in the past couple of weeks, but it's, you so, know, some, some Wasabi joins and join market things um, did have it run. It, it seemed to me kind of like they are trying to apply it um, in the more recent blocks um, as much as possible. But like the further back you go, it's, it's kind of just like it's applied less and less to these larger transactions. Look, they updated it uh, relatively recently, maybe like a week and a half ago. A KYCP is obviously run by the Samurai guys. Um, it, it is a compute thing, right? Like the, the larger the transactions, the, the harder it is for them to do it. Um, you know, I don't think KYC's, KYCP is perfect, but uh, I think it's pretty fucking awesome. And I hope more people build competing services um, because it's pretty amazing to me how, you know, s someone even in my position, like I have trouble getting my hands on like a chain analysis subscription or something like that. So it'd be really nice if we saw um, 
you know, more tools pop up that allow people to basically run their own chain analysis. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if it would be open source too. Yeah, but it, it's but you know you know what I mean though, Matt. It's kind of like I I get it, and it's not at all reasonable to just be like you know pay the money to to apply this to everything. Like the costs are asymmetrical, but it's like well at the same time like shouldn't there be some kind of clarification of that when you are using this to kind of sell your own product? Yeah, I mean they could disclose that it's related to Sabri more. Doesn't really say it on the web page. Well, it's, it's not even that. Like everybody knows that. I just mean, like you know, kind of clarify why some things are not even being rated through Boltzmann. You know, what I mean, like if I see a wasabi mix that's massive and it's just not being rated, like there there should be an explicit unmissable thing that's like Boltzmann was not applied because of this computational cost, and like you know what I mean. I think it shows that now. Awesome. It says it says when when Boltzmann's not it's it says on the top either like uh, wasn't able to compute or recent transaction uh, you know you have to wait for it to compute. Um, so it sounds like sixty one hundred two's been fucking keeping busy badgering people. <laughs> sixty one hundred two is the best. I love that dude. Mm -hmm. Me me and him have had some heated uh, discussions before, but it's it usually winds up we see each other's points. You know, the other thing is like humans inherently have bias and, you know, the way that privacy is approached in the Bitcoin space, a lot of it is subjective in terms of what people think are best practices. And this code is written by people. So, um, it, you know, it clearly favors their implementation details over Wasabi's implementation details. But the Samurai guys would say that's a feature, not a bug. You know, that's kind of why I would say that's a little bit deceptive. And it's, you know, the, these kinds of things are why I really have issue with them. Like, you know, my, my issues with the Samurai team, ultimately, almost none of them have anything to do with their, their protocol or their service or their software. It's the manner in which they are attempting to market that. Oh, man, but it's it's just you know what I mean it's I, I feel like people kind of won't look at these these kind of dynamics and really try to suss through them. It just becomes which which tribes flag are you waving? Yeah, I mean I don't like the blind tribal stuff uh, in general, uh, and we see it we see it a lot in this space. So um, that's why I try and uh, stay as objective as possible and just talk everything through. Mm hmm. All right, and I guess let's uh, let's just dive through this last Shinobi's irritation point. So, really, th this one I kind of want to show, at least from what I see in my opinion, as kind of a, a double standard when when it comes to criticizing samurai and wasabi. And it's, I, I kind of want to look at the issue of wasabi's change address reuse versus samurai's. Uh, you know, provision of a, a backend server to give balanced data to light users. And, you know, I've, I've been very critical um, recently of that design decision on Samurai's part. And the reason I've been very critical of that is because, you know, that's a single point of failure. And it has nothing to do with Samurai being malicious. Um, it, it's just what happens when Iran or China or North Korea come knocking on their back end to compromise it and gather data because they think a large amount of their population is using that software? Like, point blank. Like, I, I love what the samurai guys have built, but they're living in fantasy land riding unicorns if they think they can secure their back end against something like that. But I, it's constantly... You know, when, I, when that criticism is brought up, it's, well, don't use it then. That's their design decision. But if you flip that around to the, the address reuse with Wasabi, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different reaction. It's not, well, don't use it. It's a design decision. It's why aren't you changing this? And ultimately, the, the kind of potential improvement that could make or risk that that change in Wasabi could mitigate 
is insignificantly irrelevant compared to the potential risk of that design choice on Samurai's part. And so I, I just find it very strange how criticizing a design decision with a potential fallout like that is met with, well, then don't use it. But criticizing a design decision that ultimately isn't really going to do anything in the, the big picture um, is like, yeah, well, why aren't you changing your design decision? Um, I mean, first, uh, I guess we jump into first. Um, I mean, Dojo users are not affected by that issue. Um, I mean, they are a little bit because their non-set could get degraded post after the fact. Um, but they aren't sending their XPubs to uh, Samurai servers. So um, the more people using Dojo, the better. It seems to be getting easier and easier to use. It is getting easier and easier to use. Um, and it's very nice that people can share Dojos. So you can have like one person running a Dojo and their friends and family can scan their QR code and link up to that. And you don't have to deal with that issue. Um, the obviously it's better to remove single points of failure um the the product is a very new product uh so you know i think it comes down to priorities is is what my guess would be um and then you know how would you what what would be your setup uh that you think that could alleviate this for for users that that aren't running their own node well it's just changing how the wallet queries uh, for balance data with anything in the Postmix wallet. I mean, if, if you really sit and think it through the whole design flow, if you're being sent money, that is supposed to go to the premix wallet. You are never supposed to provide a, a Postmix wallet to just receive new funds. So you're never going to have to worry about, you know, did I get money in my Postmix wallet I don't know about if you are following this, this protocol properly. And so you should be able to just query Postmix addresses one at a time through individual Tor circuits as you transact because you should never have to care about any balance changes unless you are actively transacting with the Postmix wallet. And so you, you can tweak things like this so that even light users are only querying about a single address through a single Tor circuit and breaking things up individually like that and never actually sending a master pub key for the Postmix wallet. And that does not create, if you, you do this properly, any issues of, well, the user could get money that they, they never find out about. So send addresses, not pub keys. Mm-hmm. You know, anything that it, that improves the process, I'm I'm good for. Um, I would like to see, there's a bunch of things I would like to see in Samurai in terms of stability and, and mobile mixing and rolling all this stuff out as well. Uh, so I really do think it comes down to uh, priorities. Um, yeah. And yeah. And um, I, as far as, as far as the fixed fee address goes, like I was super relieved when Rasabi removed the fixed fee address. And I am aware that coin joins are trivial to track on chain, but there have been multiple cases of people getting their accounts locked at compliant exchanges, at KYC exchanges. Um, and it appears that it's all based on the proximity of, of that fee address. Um, and, you know, these exchanges like i hate kyc i hate compliance I, you know i think it it hurts users i think it's dangerous for users but these exchanges have to make a best best effort to best effort to police suspicious activity um and if you're just waving it in their face like that uh that that this transaction is you know one hop away from uh a flagged address uh or an address that interacted with the flagged address which in this case was the wasabi fee address like they can't look the other way they have to they have to enforce it yeah but you know on one note um two of the companies who've done that so far are have physical offices in singapore and the other two have important enough ties that they create routes to to have leverage over you and as far as i'm aware everybody's gotten their money back. So ultimately that this was just 
you know, a KYC business causing the headaches that they do and, and changing that, that fee address is not going to make any difference if this is an intentional decision to, to do this rather than just software doing something and nobody giving a shit to fix it. Like ultimately that issue, um, you can't solve that with code. I mean, look, they may very well flag coin join, you know, transactions with the coin join history in the future. Um, I'm based operating under that assumption. Like I could give two shits about uh, sending to a KYC exchange. So it's not a concern for me, um, but it's good that the fixed fee address was removed. So now we can see if they're actually going to do it um, and who and which which exchanges, which services will do it uh, and not have to speculate whether or not it was the fixed fee address or whether or not it was just coin join footprint on chain. Um, and in this case, it does. It, and most in all those cases, it did very much look like it was a proximity thing, not a not a footprint thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's bad that they, they made the change. Like it's definitely good. But my, my main issue was, you know, just kind of the inconsistency with like this is you're you're arguing with a developer over a design decision they made and, and kind of the, the difference between the two projects. But yeah, I'm glad they did it and we'll see how it goes, but you you, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um Yeah. I, look, I, at first, I was, um, I was in like the dojo only camp that they should just have dojo only pools. Um, but I think, like as a, when you're like threat modeling it out, like a, in like a priority perspective, um, you know, as long as you realize that you're not protecting yourself from samurai, uh, I, 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 I just feel like the usability of being able to have someone, you know, run the app on their phone, connect it to Tor and get some reasonable privacy benefits out of it um, outweighs the negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As far as mixing pools, I, I would have to agree. It's, it's, you know, I mean, yeah, you fix the problem for a Dojo user relative to the, the on paper anonymity set, but you are, you're, you're dropping the on paper anonymity set massively. Yeah, you basically would split it. In theory, I I agree with what you just said. The and it looks fine from miles away, but you know why I am afraid of of recommending Samurai anymore because you know it's really hard to evaluate a system where the the team behind it is honest, but it's impossible to evaluate the system where team behind it is just deceptive. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like, like I said, when, when I first exploded on this whole topic, like I've kind of like, I don't, I don't recommend either Wasabi or Samurai to anybody at this point, just on, on principle of boycotting the stupid. But I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, uh, I don't want to get into any details, uh, but you know, somebody messaged me uh, in the last few days asking for advice in a what they thought could be a life-threatening situation, and I recommended they use Samurai because it's it's simply the best tool to do what they needed to do or thought they needed to do in the situation. And it's you know, despite all my issues with this whole situation, when when this person came to me for advice it didn't change the fact that that was the best tool for their situation. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think a lot of this also comes down to just Twitter being a poor platform for this kind of communication and discourse. Uh, you know, people get defensive very quickly in general. Um, we're all guilty of this. And I, I, Knowing the samurai guys, and like this should be irrelevant in my opinion, but knowing the samurai guys and knowing, you know, I've met no power and some other members of the Wasabi team, like these are people that care deeply about user privacy. Um, I don't have a doubt in that regard, but um, that should be irrelevant anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess uh, before we kind of jump into the actual architecture uh, discussion of differences between the two. Hi, Janine. Glad you could make it. Hi, Shinobi. <laughs> Damn it, you decided to introduce me just as I was getting water. <laughs> I've been lurking for the past 10 minutes. 
Yeah, sorry about that. I just uh, kind of didn't want to derail the conversation, but you know how things go. Things went very well. Did you is, did you tell people why I was gone or? <laughs> uh, no, you you can go ahead and give everybody a heads up. No, I mean I don't I don't need to tell people why I missed the first half. But yes, things went well. All right, we'll leave it a mystery. <laughs> All righty, so I guess uh. The fun part, Let, let's compare and contrast uh, Samurai and Wasabi's overall architectures. Uh, so I kind of, I guess, thought this would be simplest to break into the fee structure, the mix strategy, the network level, and the post-mix tools. So I guess, uh, you know, let's, let's just dive in with the fees. Uh, you know, the, the kind of general idea of Wasabi is just a very simple everybody pays every time a mix happens um, and that gets distributed relatively evenly you know it's a very simple straightforward incentive model um if you come you pay whereas samurai is experimenting with uh, a different kind of incentive to try and actively increase the rate of remixing where they only charge a fee for a person bringing a UTXO into their first mix. And then from that point on, um, you know, you can just keep remixing while the fee is shuffled to the, the new entrance of the pool. And, you know, kind of my take on this is, you know, it's just experimentation. It's an incentive uh, based market system. You can't really see how that would go until, you know, you see how it goes. But, you know, I, I do see some potential problems with both of those. You know, at any time that the fees go up or we have a, a high demand for block space, you know, that's going to hurt everybody in Wasabi and evenly create a disincentive uh, for everybody uh, trying to participate in a mix. Um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward thing. Everybody um, slowly gets priced out as fees go up and you'll either pay the fee or you won't. Now with Samurai, that gets a little weirder because if, if those fees start going up, that extra cost is not raised proportionately um, for everybody. You know, you start having that disproportionately shoved off to new entrants um, with you know the entire system being predicated on the the people remixing aren't paying these fees and so when you start having the um you know the fees go up in that kind of model um you're going to turn away the new entrance the fees are going to go up and price some portion of those out but you know intuitively to me that that seems like that could ripple out a lot worse than in the wasabi model like in the Wasabi model, it's spread evenly. If fees go up, only people willing to pay more mix. But, you know, there's there's a lot less of a, a kind of a, how do I put this? A lot less of a even distribution in, in the, the samurai pool where a lot less people being priced out could potentially have a lot bigger effect on, on the, the sustainability of mixing. Um. I mean, I have a couple thoughts here. Uh, I mean, one of the big things is uh, for both implementations, like you need new liquidity to be coming in constantly. Um, and uh, they will both absolutely be hit hard when fees increase. Uh, it is a concern of mine just in general, just Bitcoin privacy in general. You know, using Bitcoin privately requires more transactions. It's going to have a higher transaction fee burden. Um, even if we get cross input signature aggregation, uh, you're still making more transactions than if you're just like holding in a single address and, and not doing anything. Am I cutting related. out or you're cutting out? Sorry, I think that was, you know, car. um, the other thing is, uh, remixing is extremely important. Um, one of the changes that I've wanted in Wasabi for a while is to change the default and onset that it that it targets when I, when I explain to new users how to use Wasabi, I always tell them to go into settings and switch it to 101 uh, so that it forces at least one remix. 
And I've already noticed uh, over the, you know, the last year or so that a lot of users try and do as few remixes as possible because they are being stingy about the cost. Um, uh, just to be clear here, like I think I really like Samurai's implementation uh in in this respect because not only is it incentivizing the remixes um it's removing the change from any of the future mixes because it gets removed right in the beginning the both the change and the fee gets paid right in the beginning it means that all the transactions that are being mixed all the utxos that are being mixed are exactly the same for the whole entirety of the pool forever um instead of this case with wasabi where it's constantly getting smaller and smaller uh so that people can remix while still being able to pay the fee and the other thing is because it's a fixed flat fee in this case it's five percent for whatever the pool size is so if you're going into the 1 million sat pool it's 50k sats you know 0 0.01 bitcoin pool it's it's 50k sats uh regardless of how much you send in so it creates an interesting incentive there in terms of if you are a larger user um, in terms of Sybil resistance, because if someone's trying to Sybil and run multiple implementations at the same time, um, they're going to pay a lot larger fees than someone who's an honest actor who just, you know, wants their mixes to go through eventually and is willing to send it all in one uh, remix transaction because they get a lot lower fees. And then Whirlpool knows, because it's all part of the same transaction, zero remix transaction, it knows it's the same user. So it's able to give honest users a lower cost while keeping the civil burden high for someone who's attacking uh, attacking the, the mix. Yeah, Can I ask you how much is the samurai fee? For, for the one, it's 5% of whatever pool size. So if you go into, the 0 0.01 Bitcoin pool, the 1 million sat pool, it's 50k sats. And you, I mean, come on, you are saying that this is in any way cheaper than the Wasabi fees, which is 0.003% well, per it's, other participants? It's because if you send in, if you send in 0.5 Bitcoin into that pool, or you send in 10 Bitcoin into that pool, it's always 50k sats. Yeah, the the and, longer you mix, the the more your your overall cost per mix asymptotically drops to zero. No, but even the the larger the amount you send into the pool to begin with keeps your cost low. Do you want to calculate how many mixes you would have to do to to get to the wasabi? I, I don't even understand. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's so, just so, it's it's mathematically guaranteed if you keep remixing that eventually it'll smooth out. But, no, but you, the, even the, when the, you enter, even when you enter the pool, if you enter with a large enough amount, the yeah, percentage I, I, I get cost what you're is saying, very like low. You, you kind of stake your starting point on the graph, depending on how much you put in, and the more you put in, the the lower your your cost on the graph is, and they all just trend to zero the longer you mix. Right. Mm -hmm. But like kind of my, my issue, though, is when you really think about that, um, you know, think, think through the, the incentive structure of this whirlpool straight up depends on either people who stopped remixing being willing to pay the cost again or just straight up new liquidity coming in to, to keep this working. Whereas the way Wasabi works, there's no requirement, strictly speaking, um, to at least maintain a, a set, roughly speaking, um, for new people to come in. Like you'll pay the fee if you mix and it's evenly distributed. The, the, there is no requirement for, you know, the, the sitting around the table and like, I don't want to pay the fee, who will and who breaks first? Like it's just if, if you mix, you pay. And so there's kind of a different reaction there uh, with each system, you know, if, if new influxes of liquidity stop coming in or if people decide to, to be a cheap ass as hardcore as they can. But I mean, regardless, you're going to need new liquidity for both. Um, and fee pressure is going to hurt it. I, the other thing is, is that Wasabi's fee, fee structure incentivize, uh, like, it incentivizes inflating the fees on Wasabi's end. Um, 
Like if I was wasabi, I would just be going into as many of the mixes as possible to just drive up the cost. Yeah. But okay. It's... Okay. No, it's it's a very important point because I keep hearing this all the time. So and, and I never did the calculation, and I would like to do the calculation now, right now. So five okay. percent. You have one bitcoin. It's five percent, and you can mix forever. No. Is, is that correct? It's five percent of 0 0.01 bitcoin even though you're putting in one bitcoin it's five percent of what the pool size is so you put oh, in okay. one bitcoin and you pay 50k sats if you go into the to the 0 0.01 pool oh okay that, but but you are doing it 10 times my point is that for one bitcoin it's easy to calculate but so if no, you no, have one Matt's bitcoin then is that you have to do bitcoin it 10 only, times no that's what he's saying is like you only pay the fee once no matter whether you put in only 0.01 or you put in a whole bitcoin you can put in 100 bitcoin you still pay 50k sats that's it and the reasoning there is because whirlpool knows it's all the same user so it's able to provide civil resistance because none of those resulting 0.01s are ever going to be in the same mix together okay so what would you say is a fair comparison let's say 10 Bitcoin, would, would, would that be interesting? Calculate the fees for 10 Bitcoin. But 10 Bitcoin going into the, we already know it on Samurai, regardless of how many times you remix, it's going to be 50K sets. Okay, so let me calculate it on Wasabi. 10 Bitcoin um, with five participants. So let's say it's the very first mix then. 0 0.015 multiplied by 10 so that would be right no because it's percentage so okay i'm doing it do, do, so do, 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 zero, 0 0.15 la would be the and and then you have to add the percentage to that so it would be 0. Point Zero zero fifteen. This would be the first round, and every round is similar. So, uh, how much is that? It would be, I think, around point one something. Although I am very bad at napkin math in my no, head. No, no, I just calculated it. It's zero point zero zero fifteen. Uh, how much is that in terms of comparison? uh 50k sets or, or i'm not sure but per one mix it's cheaper but like that's kind of the, the point is like th think of like a graph you, wasabi has a low starting point but trends up if you're counting successive mixes samurai has a dynamic starting point that would be higher but trends down wasabi is trending down too by no, the but way, I mean, be because if you did they, a, notice the remixes free. are almost free. No, but my point is, is like you still pay a fee. So the net fee is going to trend up for the, the whole set of remixes. Whereas with Samurai, it's going to trend down because you, you're not paying for the remixes at all. Yeah, that's correct. Cool, but uh, it's trending up logarithmically anyway. Uh, the, so okay. The, the core point, so, though, is the, the incentives and like how the different incentives are going to function at different fee conditions well the so, other thing to, the other thing to keep in mind here is because um because they use the same amount uh that all that all outputs that are being mixed in the pool are the exact same amount and that it 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 automatically makes sure that it forces that every every round has both remixes and uh new liquidity in it um you actually get more than just that just more than just those five utxos in your anon set because you, you you have the the trail of remixes going behind you um which further clouds the picture yeah it's the exact same in wasabi uh, this is why it, it wasn't our decision that make remixing fee almost free it was because they don't have enough money to to pay the fee that 0 0.1 bitcoin ish 
in Wasabi that we consider 0.1 Bitcoin, if that's the input. So the statistics is 30% of the transactions are remixes and they don't leave any change. Uh, so th there is no difference there, you know. 30% of what Wasabi participants inputs. are remixers? Inputs, yes. But it doesn't force remixing. And it's not the exact same amount. Okay, this I think, I think this is a, a perfect segue to kind of shift into talking about the mix strategies in general, uh, rather than just kind of the fee component of it. And, you know, th this is kind of where I see a, a bigger weakness in terms of samurai strategy. And it comes down to economic incentives. A rational economic actor is going to try to get whatever service or good they want at the most cost effective price possible. And the way Wasabi's entire mix strategy is structured with the larger an, or an onset and, and more kind of openness in how people participate is, you know, it's people will use it how they're going to use it. And that might make it a little less effective in terms of maintaining anonymity set. It might make it more so. It's, it's a dynamic thing. Whereas Samurai is trying to create this very tightly structured, like, you know, I, I, I can't think of any other way to say it except centrally planned, although I do not mean that in like a, their commies uh, sense, <laughs> but like, you know, strategy to, to control that. And I'm not so sure that's going to work in the long term as fees go up when the the economically rational user is going to look at that constrained framework that's imposing higher costs on them and try to get around that because they're going to want to save money. I don't know what you're talking about, to be honest. I mean, let, let's put it in, in terms of post-mix stuff. If your wallet literally will not let a user combine two UTXOs, they have to combine to buy something, they're just going to move that money to a wallet that will. They have to do something. Like I do not think that the philosophy of putting a user in a tightly confined space that's supposed to make them act a certain way will actually work in the long run. But, I mean, I, mean, I, I think... This is not specific to like any particular implementation or wallet. Um, I mean, just teaching users UTXO management is is like almost an impossible task. Uh, we see it with Wasabi's toxic change. Uh, people don't want to leave nine hundred dollars there and never touch it. Um, so you know they end up doing bad practices. So they prevent users from merging together their outputs post-mix, is that? Well, I'm just saying that like th there is a very like surgical controlled nature to how Samurai is trying to construct their entire mixing and post-mix like tool set. Whereas Wasabi is coming from the attitude of like users can do and will do what they want to do let's try and slowly improve from that and so, the point i'm trying to make is like i think that approaching it that way is going to work better because you're going to have less baked in structural things that the users are just going to completely ignore and fight against when it's in their incentive to do so so i'm, I'm currently testing uh their new mobile app that should be released soon um and so on Samurai, your pre-mix and your post-mix wallets are segregated, two completely different wallets. Um, so when you go to the post-mix, first of all, when you go, when you go from uh, pre-mix to post-mix um, and you start that mixing transaction, that world transaction, it's going to tell you how many outputs you're going to have and it's going to tell you how, how much it's going to cost. Then you press OK, you press the mix button. And then it says, you have this much change left over. This is toxic change. Do you want to label it and mark it do not spend? 
So if the user presses yes in that situation, the transaction gets labeled and by default, it never, it never shows up in your balance screen and it's not spendable. When you go to the Postmix wallet, you can, it defaults to a Stonewall transaction, which is a simulated coin join, which actually does merge inputs, uh, but by design. So instead of paying just barely over what you're supposed to pay and get the change, it might pay a decent amount over it so that you have, for instance, 4.01 inputs and then on the other side two sets of equal input uh equal outputs um but also you have the option there to go into like a utxo coin selection mode where you can choose if you want to spend a specific utxo if you want to mark things do not spend if you want to mark things spend you could go in the reverse way and for the those to that toxic change that was also flagged you can go back and you can you can specifically spend that UTXO if you want to. But that's kind of my point, Matt, is like, think about all of that. That's enforcing scattering UTXOs and only merging them in a specific way. That's enforcing incurring higher costs. Um, you know, it's every input, you get the input plus all the signature data to add to the fees. Like this is... The minute that starts becoming burdensomely expensive, the users are going to try to fight that and ignore that. And it's just the whole structure of trying to create all of these things to guarantee we're going to make the user act the way that we want them to. I don't think that's effective. I think you need to look at how a user does act and then build from there. And it's, it's it's just a big it's a big fundamental problem, especially when you start really looking at the big picture. Like I like Stonewall, but really think about that. Your your post mix is spending Stonewall. It's only mixing your outputs. Eventually, you're going to spend that somewhere. People spend money in the same places, and even when things like pay join and snowball come along, merchants are going to start snowballing and connecting those things, and you still have patterns emerge. You know what I mean? And real and th th those patterns ultimately are going to emerge anyway, but you're just incurring a massive cost for the user to delay those patterns emerging. And it's like, wh why, why would a user go with that? They, 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 they would just start fighting it when it's in their incentive to do so. I think privacy is always going to be more expensive in Bitcoin. Um, I think, you know, that's just how it's going to be, uh, unfortunately. Um, I think that users are really poor at UTXO management. Um, we've seen this in Wasabi, like, I, I, I still don't know why that select all buttons there, but tons of them just combine all their post mix outputs right after the fact. Um, so I, I think like the, the way to handle this is exactly how Samurai is handling, or at least it's good that we have one wallet trying to do it because you give them basically the tools for best practices that protect themselves from shooting themselves in the foot. And then you give them an advanced tab where they can do whatever the hell they want. If they want to shoot themselves in the foot, they can shoot themselves in the foot. But if they go through the regular flow, they probably won't fuck themselves as much as they would otherwise. There are a lot of things here and too little time to go into everything. So anyway, funny story. This premix and postmix thing, I came up with it and wrote into zero link. And the reasoning was that obviously premix coins with postmix coins should not be merged but also another reasoning where there is that i came up with zero link in a way that i imagined it oh every wallet is going to use it so premix wallets doesn't need so every wallet can mix but the postmix wallet needs real privacy premix wallets don't really need it they can they can be mobile wallets, they can be anything. They can join together their inputs, their outputs, but the post-mix wallets make sure that the mixed coins are properly separated. Now, there was some interest from Samurai and Dark Wallet and Breeze Wallet, but not, not the Breeze Wallet, the, not the Lightning Breeze Wallet, the Stratis Breeze Wallet, anyway. But, but uh, ended up uh, only implementing 
I ended up only implementing into hidden wallet. Um, and later on, right, Wasabi and Samurai. But anyway, at that point into hidden wallet, so, okay, well, looks like the premix and postmix wallet are the exact same thing. So let's just create a better user experience there instead of going from one wallet to another. And what's the better user experience if you have a visual sign of, well, this is red and this is green and you don't want the two to join together. So why is the select all button? It's because Wasabi works differently than Bitcoin Core, and I very, very painfully experienced that. That in I thought Bitcoin Core works just like Wasabi. So in Bitcoin Core, I was very careful for years uh, getting money into that, and then I selected all the coins and I sent some money to someone, and it actually put every coin into the same transaction. I'm like, fuck, that's one year of careful work of me trying to protect my privacy. And just like that, it's, it's over. So that's how Bitcoin Core works. How Wasabi works, you select all the coins and Wasabi tries to figure out which ones are the most private to spend. And there is a lot of, uh, a lot of factors coming into that, even your labels. The, anyway, the point is that if you select all, it doesn't mean you're going to spend all. That's that's not the case. Yeah, but they click select all and then they click the max button. Yes, yes. That's yeah. how you <laughs> spend all. But then you still get the notification that with red that, hey, uh, merging. In fact, you don't even have to send press max button. It just If you select all, then you get the notification that merging uh, red and green is not a good idea or probably the very worst idea that you can do with that. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, I... even that uh, could be a good idea because if you, but in Wasabi, we don't show that, but if you actually get some money from a completely other source and then you are uh, joining them together into the same coin join or something like that, then that, the assumptions are completely thrown off and the blockchain analysis art is just becomes crazy because well there is no clear link between two things and then you put it into the mix and then something else comes out wait that doesn't make sense okay i i think this this doesn't make sense there was something where it's a good idea to merge but it's better well, not yeah, to merge if you intentionally are trying to create false links or something like that, but the the the, the, the core point is is you know the, these types of guides and things work now because it's cheap to do so. But you know the the more difficult you you make getting around that type of stuff, you're you're just making it worse when it starts getting not cost effective. Like users are going to go around that anyway. And I think like one of the most important things in terms of privacy stuff in this space is you have to think like how cost effective is this for a user? Like, is this as cost effective as we can make it? And is this going to stay cost effective in different fee environments? Because that's really the core question of, of whether or not people will keep using these things as those variables change. I, 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 I disagree think... with I think you're gonna you're gonna like the new the new app. They the the way they handle the advanced tab and giving users the choice to to you know go with the lower cost option if they don't want to do the Stonewall spend um, is I, I think it's a very clean, very user friendly interface. Uh, the the other thing I wanted to say here is I I definitely I really appreciate the fact um, that there is. Uh, a warning when you try and merge the toxic chains with postmix um as far as select all my bigger issue is the select all private button because I, I still don't really get where that would ever be useful even if you're not sending the full amount you're going to end up linking some of those postmixes together um 
And then the other thing is like the toxic change in wasabi is more toxic, especially if you haven't done a remix, I would say, than the toxic change um, in Samurai. Why did uh, because, you say this? Because it's directly paid out during the mix. Um, so if you end up um, exposing yourself with that toxic change, uh, it could reduce the anonymity set of everyone else way easier. Okay. But, I mean, anyway, that, one wait, thing I wanted quick. to say that uh, I, I have a lot of critics of Samurai, but this is actually not one of them. And, and I disagree with you know, beyond this issue. I mean, I, I, I think Stonewall does more bad than good, but they're separating the wallets uh, f physically. That actually something that I, I, I actually... <laughs> let's say, respect them for that decision. Really quick, though, it's like, this is, like, the thing about that, the change issue, Matt, um, like, that. that's, there's no difference in that change handling, whether you do it inside of a mix or outside of a mix. Like, anonymity set calculation <clears throat> has nothing to do with transactions. It's inputs and outputs. So whether that is being peeled off uh, in a mix or before a mix, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is it does not recombine with things later on. So that that that's an entirely post mix issue. Like that's that has nothing to do with any difference in the mathematics of either uh, mixing strategy. As as long as as long as you or one participant in the five per five person or five UTXO, I guess, uh, whirlpool uh, round remixes, that toxic change becomes less toxic to you every time it remixes. No, but my point is like the same applies yeah, to yes, Wasabi. Actually. Like that that change has no bearing on a, a loss of anonymity set unless it is is something stupid is done with it post mix so that that that's that has nothing to do with the mixing it's all about post mix handling uh, let me also point out that there is i'm not sure how familiar are you with the knopsock paper or the the cash fusion paper or or the whole discussion that that sparked on the bitcoin dev mailing list that there are actually <laughs> Unintuitively, there is value mixing unequal amounts. But I, yeah, it, it, no, it's not a fair argument because the coordinator knows the change. So no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make that argument here. Sorry. Well, I mean, different amount mixing is just a necessary thing because of block space efficiency. Like that, that is that is absolutely going to be necessary long term. I mean, like you know, a, a big part. Like, let, me, let me put it this way. Coin joins that are designed for privacy are going to have to deal with the fact that coin joins are going to become very common that just do not give a shit about the privacy consequences of them. They're just doing it to save money. And so the, these things need to figure out how to coexist with each other and, you know, optimally actually synergize with each other. Just from like a signature aggregation point of view, yeah, I'm I mean, uh, I'm not sold necessarily on the privacy benefits, but well, I mean, don't you see benefit in if you if you're trying to condense coins that you've mixed previously? Don't you see the benefit of mixing with other people also doing that? Like, shouldn't there be a mixing procedure and policy for destroying anonymity set rather than creating it? so that it's done in the least destructive way possible. I mean, it's definitely better than uh, just a regular transaction, especially one that spends the whole balance. But it's, you know, it's you, you, people need to start thinking about that kind of thing. Like we're, we're in a system with scarce space for transactional capacity and the, the, privacy technology needs to to work with that it needs to acknowledge that and figure out how that can actually be used as a strength absolutely all right so i guess yeah you know, i don't really think we we need to get into the whole network level comparison i think that that is fully understood by anybody who's going to listen to this so uh 
I don't know, you guys want to kind of jump ship into the, the general uh, privacy situation uh, from the political legal sense? Where do you want okay. to start? Uh, I think we start with the FATF travel rule and uh, this slow ripple of turning anything that custodies crypto into a bank pretty much that we see going on. Like I, I forget the name of the company. Um, I think Cipher Trace was working with them. Um, but you know, there, there's literally companies in this space working on second layer protocols for exchanges to give your KYC information to other exchanges in the process of of transacting Bitcoin between them. Like oh, that's. They're... They're absolutely sharing information. I mean, if they're not, we should just assume that they're all sharing information with each other. Um, I but mean, my my point yeah. is, they're protocolizing it. You know, like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna beat a dead horse here. I I do this every couple months. But do, do you remember the chain anchor program that came yeah. out of MIT in 2016? Yeah, MIT in 2016 laid out a protocol that would start bribing miners, um, effectively subsidizing them to preferentially confirm Bitcoin transactions that identified themselves with KYC using a second layer, with the ultimate goal being to start bribing miners once you have a ma or majority participating in this program to orphan blocks that are mining any transaction without this KYC tag and effectively just subsidize the miners doing that so that they're they're not experiencing an increase in operational costs. And this was something in 2016 that the MIT lab developed. Like I think it's time to to seriously start looking back at all the little things like that that have been talked about and proposed over the last few years and like you know did you really think that they they just made that that protocol to just throw on a paper pile and forget about no that's that's the idea pile of, of what are we going to do now over the next few years yeah i mean look their dream is kyc at the protocol level i just uh i don't think that they'll be able to enforce it uh we, we've seen mining distribute more over time uh we had a very uh dark area there with bitmain uh, in late 2017, um, but since then it seems to be distributing, and I, I, I believe it will distribute further over time. Um, and as long as mining is permissionless and anyone can plug in a miner, and they're based in a lot of different jurisdictions, um, you know, it's it's going to be miners are going to take higher fees uh, if it's. If it if there's a monetary incentive there for them to take a higher fee, they're going to take that higher fee. And then if other miners that are complicit would want to orphan those blocks, like they're going to risk killing their golden goose. There, they're going to, uh, you know, they they don't want to bring the chain to. They don't want to make the chain ineffective. If they make the chain ineffective, then they're mining a worthless token. You know, two months ago, I would have agreed with you, but. With the the outbreak happening right now, nothing new is getting produced. Most of the hash rate is still in China, and that that's not getting shipped out anywhere now. And you know, like I said when we got started earlier, I I, I think Bitcoin right now is the last thing on the Communist Party's mind. But all that hash rate is trapped there. And the global production systems to, to build more is, is offline right now. So th on the other side of this, like this, this is a very precarious and different situation we could wind up in versus the outlook before this outbreak happened. Sure. You know, I just, you know, that we, we see more has, as long, you know, the, this whole Chinese mining uh, concern is we've heard this for so many years and it has continuously gotten better. Um, you know, if, if we had to do a, like a worst case scenario option, then you're, you know, you're talking about things like POW changes, uh, just hard forks in general. Uh, and you know, 
if it has to come to that, it has to come to that. Uh, if, if it's government pressure, then the game theory incentives don't really matter. Uh, the cha- the miners won't care about killing the golden goose if they have a gun to their head and they have no choice. Um, but I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, it's just it's not high up on my concern as opposed to something like uh, who even knows. But I, my guess would be like 80 percent, 90 percent of new Bitcoin holders as they come in are getting KYC seed. And we have these databases that aren't necessarily anchored into the transactions, but they're just being shared around um, in all these data sharing agreements. So they have these massive databases of addresses and KYC information. Um, so, you know, if if governments wanted to target Bitcoin users, uh, identify them and then target them, uh, it wouldn't be that that difficult of a task for them. And I, I don't know if that would it, it would hurt Bitcoin short term, but it, it might not kill it long term, but it would definitely hurt like individual Bitcoiners. Um, And that's why these privacy tools and the development of them is so important. So since we are talking, uh, sorry, since we are talking about the importance of privacy, I would like to put this into another perspective. The real issue is, is Wasabi takes money for providing privacy. And this is outrageous, not because we do take money it's because we can it's because privacy is doesn't come by default and that's the real issue here so there is a paradox here is that is that our real success is that we go out of business right because everyone has privacy by default which should be by default yeah, but that's that's just not gonna happen without a fight, you know. And I think you know, re- regardless of whether you want to look at the the potential threat of mining as a choke point or custodial institutions and on ramps as a choke point, it's just the the situation that that that's the this the required standard by governments is you pretty much bend people over and give them the rectal probe, and that's I'm- you know this issue I don't think can be solved entirely with software or code or privacy tools like ultimately it it, like this take it to the extreme you can't solve it all with code you have a choice of pick up a gun or take action within the legal system those are your options to solve that that part of this problem that you can't solve with code well, I mean, I think there's a key dynamic here that with mining, um, if you have the hardware and if you have the electricity, um, you know, you can mine relatively privately. Uh, you can mine through Tor. Uh, you know, it's not going to be as profitable, but you can do it privately. Uh, you can mine out of band, you know, using like satellite and stuff like that. There's ways to do that. You can run like a KYC exchange. I mean, it becomes KYC, but you can't run like a fiat connected business where you make a profit and not, you know, not put your neck on the line and be pressured. Like it's, it's a super easy pressure point where with mining, like we have rough ideas of where the miners are located, where the large operations are located. Um, But definitely as it goes over time, it's going to be harder and harder to determine exactly who the miners are and where they're located. And to deal with the the issue of exchanges, it's, well, do you want to pick up a gun and overthrow your government? Or do you want to reform it so that they don't require this type of crazy information collection? Because it's it's, it's that or, or just don't interact with it, period. And that's just realistically not viable. Yeah. And I, I would just, I would also add just a no powers point. Um, I, you know, I think it's 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 really important um, that every Bitcoin user is able to verify the supply, make sure that there's no hidden inflation or shenanigans going on. Um, you know, if we can find ways to improve the default privacy guarantees without compromising that factor, um, then I'm 100% in support of it. Um, but if the token has no value because you can't verify it, or has negligible value because you can't verify it, then you can't send private transactions without a trusted third party anyway. 
because you need that bearer instrument. If you don't have that bearer instrument um, with value, accruing value, then then there's no transaction happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there is the question that if there is no privacy, are we are we really working on the right thing? You know, I mean, it can very well be that Bitcoin will be the largest surveillance system of the world in the future. And maybe maybe we are contributing to this this post apocalyptic scenario, you know? Dude, that's why I am so ardently against the retarded big block attitude that you see in the Bcash camp. That has been the single worry I've had about this since I got involved in this space. Like, yeah, that very well could happen. That's guaranteed to happen if this this whole system was just a few data centers. Yeah, that could happen. And like ultimately, we can write completely flawless privacy tools that do everything they need to do. But that's not going to fix the problem if we don't address governments forcing businesses to attach all this information to things and make it that surveillance system. Because you can, you can have the most perfect privacy tools in the world. It doesn't matter if everybody's still interacting with all of these types of institutions that are forced to collect data and, and tie it to our activity on the system. It, it, it completely undoes all the privacy gains. Just use Monero. But um, <laughs> So, perfect transition here. Obviously, Bitcoin privacy is completely fucked, guys. It's never going to happen. It's going to be KYC coin. So, you guys should all look into Mimblewimble coin. It's up like 300% uh. in the last few days, guys. Come on. Come on. Privacy coins are going to happen, dude. It's not happening on Bitcoin. I'm what happy fuck, we man. finally came to an agreement. <laughs> I, uh, you know, Trace has been going around with this anti-privacy, Nouriel's narratives um, about how CoinJoin is criminal, all CoinJoin users are criminal, anyone who buys without KYC um, is, is inherently criminal. He constantly brings up terrorist Bitcoin and North Korean Bitcoin, even though companies like Chain Analysis uh, who have a, the reverse incentive to make it look worse than it is are saying, you know, 11% of, of coin join transactions are connected to illicit activity. It's a very low number, especially coming from chain analysis. And I, I couldn't understand it because even though, um, you know, a lot of us that are focused on privacy understand that there is concerns, heavy concerns here in terms of fungibility and privacy um, to to actually go out and and basically pitch the narratives of the state here, uh, criminalizing privacy in that way uh, made no logical sense. Like even if you have the concerns about it, don't go out. And even if you don't want to coin join yourself, don't go out and uh, use your influence to try and convince people not to get better privacy when they use Bitcoin. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. It made no fucking sense to me. And then when I found out that he was shilling this bottom of the barrel of shit coin, um, at least it made logical sense. He was being desperate. He was being greedy. Um, but fuck that shit. I, I just, the, and if you read the website, if you go to, if you go to the website for the coin, it reads like Trace wrote the whole thing. It's got a 50% pre-mine. It probably has just a heavy, heavy bag of that pre-mine. Uh, and yeah, just shake my head. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm definitely not going to excuse the, the whole Mimble Wimble coin and that whole aspect of things, but it's, you know, I, I've, I've talked to Trace a few times and I, I, I will at least give him like his attitude about coin joining and like what that means to the user that that has been his consistent position for as long as I've known him or paid attention it, to him. It's the dumbest argument ever because if, a coin join user or someone who uses no KYC is complicit with terrorists and North Koreans. Then what does that make someone who's holding holding a privacy coin that is closely held shit coin? Like I know. How, I how, mean, is, how is that not like? And, I know. It's, and the it's, thing it's is, a nonsense I, argument. I, but I it's... would never. I'll, I'll call it a shit coin. I'll tell. I'll tell people that I think that coin is going to trend to zero long term in Bitcoin. Um, but. I, I would never I would never go out there as much as 
Trace is pissing me off right now. I would never go out there and publicly say that Trace is complicit with terrorism and money laundering and crime. But meanwhile, he's going out there and saying that about me and saying that about other people who care about their privacy and Bitcoin. And I, I just can't stand for that. He like go fuck himself. Dude, I get it. And like, fuck him. The narrative and the hyperbole around it is horseshit. I just, I have to give him like the clarification that that attitude about things predated the fucking obvious shit coin. Like it's fucking horseshit. The fucking Mimble Wimble coin is scammy as all fucking hell. But like, y you know what I mean? Guys, I'm I'm so out of the loop that I just realized that this Mimble Wimble coin, this is the actual name of the coin. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just you guys were saying this because they don't like to call it that. And yeah. also, what's, what's up with Trace? I mean, I heard that he he doesn't... He, he doesn't really like Bitcoin privacy solutions, but but he actually went ahead and started doing this member Wimble coin. Is is that is is that real? Is is that what's happening? He let his bags uh, steer his actions. Is the way I will put it charitably. He was at the Bitcoin conference in the first of all, no power. Every time I when I first heard about it, I thought he was talking about Grin. I didn't think there was a fucking coin called Mimblewimble coin yeah. either. Uh, but he, he was just at the recent Vegas conference, Unconfiscatable, and he was passing out these like these little papers that said like mimble wimble coin just went up 100x good money with like a link to his website it was like the most desperate ridiculous little shill paper ever it's i see thank you for the explanation i have only one question left so where do i buy <laughs> <laughs> it dumped today someone was uh double spend attacking it i wonder uh, why the only exchange that supports it I'd like to see more of that on bcash yeah, it's yeah, just you know, bad. It's really I, I, bad. I had a friend who was telling me, hey, hey, this is this Lisk. And it was back in 2014 or 15. This is this Lisk coin. This is what we have to buy. And I'm like, what? Man, you, you know it's a scam, right? It's, it's obviously a scam. He said, oh, yes, definitely. I, I know it's a scam. That's why we have to buy it because they have, they're going to pump it up. And <laughs> so it's... <laughs> Why <laughs> Mimba Mimba coin? Yeah. It's just sad, man, because it's like, it's like, what the fuck, dude? I know he's smart enough to see the horse shit coming out of his mouth, and he, he's just torching like a, an almost decade long reputation. Like, what, like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? Well, he's showed like Pivx in the past. Like, he's showed some really questionable projects but this is like an this is a new low and attacking attacking bitcoin users who are trying to gain back some privacy is just like really really bottom of the barrel Dude, for me and then the that, other thing is okay. did really? you see like four months ago three months ago he endorsed bobby lee and his product mm -hmm. uh fucking ballet crypto with the pre-generated keys i gave him like, shit for that but the, the, the thing fuck? though the, the privacy shit though the, that's that like out of all of this is what is just like what the fuck in my mind with like how involved he has been with Caitlin Long in Wyoming trying to craft like banking laws and regulations and property laws and regulations that line up how the legal system is looking at things with a more rational like connection to how shit actually works and he he just privacy isn't isn't an important issue like that can you, equivalent I can just to property imagine rights him, i can imagine him sitting there in wyoming with the regulators talking about me and other coin join users and saying how we're all terrorists and they should be banned like i yeah. just imagine <laughs> it and then they all laugh they all laugh together with that that laugh of his like fuck that shit man i'm not cool with that yeah, because it's like, this is like, dude, I mean, yeah, p aligning how the law interprets property in relation to, to Bitcoin is very important. 
but so is how it applies fucking privacy laws given that this system is completely different in structure than every other system those laws were made for so it's like to have this attitude and talk this kind of shit instead of get your fucking skin in the damn game the way he has with property rights laws it's like are you fucking kidding me dude like seriously but he's he's doing privacy he's doing mimba bimba coin right mm. So I guess that's his rationale there that he's doing more for privacy because he's going deeper, right? That's nonsense though. Maybe not. Maybe he's right. And maybe we're just fucking up Bitcoin instead of building a real privacy technology. Hmm? And it's like, dude, the th- it, like kind of slide into like one of the other things I wanted to touch on here, like the, the, the landscape to try and make that argument has never been better like holy shit the rate at which people's private information financial information is fucking compromised nowadays like how rampant things like identity theft are i mean like holy shit we uh, we we just found out that the the u.s government is indicting and thinks that it was four chinese military officers that hacked equifax (laughs) like um Like, Trace, you don't think this is the time to start making the arguments in the fucking legal system that the collection of this information needs to be trimmed way the fuck down? It puts us all at risk. All that information puts us all at risk. And then any government who compromises it can use it against us, not just our own. Um, And yeah, it's and and this idea that that him supporting Mimblewimble coin is a good faith act towards private private usage of money is absolutely fucking ridiculous because as i said earlier you know if if and and he he might very well be in meetings with regulators pushing for this based on his public statements but if if they if they come down hard on coin join usage and they just start basically restricting self custody altogether and private usage of bitcoin like you could bet your fucking ass that they're going to do that for any privacy focused chain there is um so you know, I there, there's no good faith here. He's just trying to pump in a liquid shit coin that he might very well have created based on the, the wording of those web pages. Like it talks about like hodlers of last resort and stuff. It reads like Trace just sat down one day and wrote the whole thing and took a pre mine of 50%. Yeah. And it's like, that's a serious issue. I mean, like, dude, like, you know, I, I can just see. Like the average American rolling their eyes when you, you talk about the communist party compromising the Equifax database. And it's just like, dude, like what the fuck are you talking about? Like we are talking about another nation state led by a communist dictator that definitively has intelligence networks all through this country. Like that's information to blackmail people, extort people, find people to threaten like that information quite literally has put people's lives actually at risk because what what the fuck do you think an intelligence operative in america is going to do they're going to try to find important people apply leverage and get something out of them that's what the fuck they're in this country for yeah and look it goes to your previous comment about just you know private bitcoin usage in general and like people's like user habits and user priorities um it it extends way beyond Bitcoin. Um, users give up their privacy. Uh, just people give up their privacy every day for the sake of convenience and expense and cost. Uh, that's why Gmail is the most popular email client. Um, and you know, I, I there's no easy way. There's no easy way around that. But I I do hope that one good thing about all of our information being online is that as these leaks get bigger and bigger and more dangerous. Um, it, it attracts more and more people to learn about their privacy and improve their privacy. And hopefully one day we'll hit a critical mass um, where we'll see some real change there. But, you know, until then, it's just, you know, one domino at a time. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this uh, comic book you should check out uh, called Private Eye by Brian K. Vaughn. I think it, I, I hope it doesn't go this far, but I love the story. Uh, pretty much all the major cloud uh, services and shit get compromised sometime in the, the 2030s. Everybody's private information is completely leaked. And by 2070, it's 
complete cultural norm to never give anybody your real name, wear masks and disguises when you're out in public, and that's just the general attitude of society. And it's like uh, it's it's it sounds like an absurd comic book story, but if if this trend keeps continuing, I mean, well, can, as a person who does many of those things, I hope that we don't have to reach a point where everyone's private information, well, to some degree, uh a lot of a large percentage of the human population has their private information in very insecure places but i hope that we don't have to get to that kind of catastrophe for people to adopt those practices because what's more likely to happen is that specific people like even if you have this mass dump specific people are going to be targeted most people won't care because they don't they they're not interesting enough to people who would want to exploit that information and so it's going to be targeted at specific people maybe uh activists journalists anyone who there is someone in power who wants to have them targeted they're going to get hurt the most um whether that's going to motivate the average person to change i don't know but hopefully you know we don't need that kind of disaster to happen before people do common sense things like you don't have to tell every starbucks barista what your real name is they just need to be able to identify this is the coffee cup it goes to you once it reaches the end of a line that's it you can give them a number you don't have to give them a name like it's just basic stuff like that and yeah the other thing that I, because th we've been talking about like implementations of wallets and coin join techniques, and um, I was asked on Twitter a few days ago, like when when do I think uh, zero knowledge stuff is going to get added to Bitcoin? And I said, basically, I said fundamentally the biggest threat to people at the moment, and I think it will be this way for some time is is kyc exchanges because you can do all the coin joining you want but if your on ramp to bitcoin was an exchange you've already exposed yourself now the biggest threat may not even be that you expose the fact that you bought certain coins and they went in this direction that the exchange was able to track um but you've given them your address you've given them you know depends on how much information they ask of you but for exchanges like coinbase they want you know they want documents um some exchanges they ask you like what you're going to do with it and especially like the they're not atms but they're like some weird thing where you go to like a teller or some kind of kiosk and some of them actually ask you to fill out a form saying what are you going to use the coins for um you've like you're basically going to get put on a list of people who bought bitcoin and even if they you know they can't know for certain how many coins you have you might have bought coins elsewhere but for the average person they can assume that the coins you bought from them are probably the only coins that you own and you probably don't have more than that and so now they're going to know well if you have these coins now and you didn't sell them uh, they can make a reasonable assumption of what your net worth is going to be a couple years, couple decades from now. Do you really want to be on that list of people? Um, I don't. You know, in a sense, traditional finance is even better than Bitcoin <laughs> because it's it's not as regulated. I mean, just just in a in a few days ago, I'm moving to a new place and I have to put down a certain amount of money and there is no bitcoin atm that could give that much money out so what i had to do is to to go to the bank and take out m my fiat savings and and what 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 was there is is that i went to the bank i asked for my money and they give it to me and i'm like oh wow you you just give my money to me I didn't know you do that. Like I'm so used to this crypto stuff that everyone is just just trying to take your money like it would be theirs. That that yes. So yeah. So traditional finance, not asking any questions. What do you want to do with it? <laughs> Let's just go back and 
and use use fiat just use fiat well i know my know banks my bank. ask way too much information and they want to know everything and they're completely overbearing and out of out of line uh, but i just want to go back to janine's comments you know i think unfortunately most most people it's not going to take other people getting you know ha- having privacy issues for them to 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 turn in the right direction they're going to need to actually get burned they're going to need to like touch the stove themselves it's just human nature unfortunately um as for like the kyc on ramps and stuff like this is one of those things that that is more of a a bootstrapping temporary issue like it, once eventually we will get to the point where it'll be pretty much closed loop bitcoin economy and instead of buying bitcoin you'll earn it and instead of selling bitcoin you'll spend it um and i think the key here is to you know we we have to be effective at, at giving people a decent level of privacy and if they use a kyc service until that point because no matter what tons of people are going to do it um and we're going to be interacting with those people if you're in the bitcoin ecosystem so you're affected by it even if you um didn't do the kyc yourself yeah and another cuz i whenever i brought this up i've i've been told by a number of people that it's it's just it's too hard for you know non-technical people to figure out how to do this without going through these exchanges and i think to some extent that's true but i think people also they kind of overestimate um how much of you know my choice to not use those services um not dox myself i think people overestimate how much of that is my technical knowledge versus just my motivation to it have you know uh, have more privacy in my life than a lot of people are interested in because i think people would actually be surprised at how little technical knowledge i have uh most of it is just motivation if you're motivated that you care about protecting yourself uh from various threats in the long term whether you face them now or not uh most of it is just motivation if you're motivated there is like the the technical knowledge barrier is not that low in terms of being able to get bitcoin in ways that you are not you know destroying your privacy i mean look that's what happened to me it was uh i mean i pretty much credit snowden because uh before that i never had the motivation or the wherewithal i just wasn't really aware i just assumed uh that the trusted third parties that we interact with on a daily basis uh had my best interests at heart naively enough um and but with snowden like it was myself getting burned it wasn't someone else getting burned i saw all this data collection that was happening to myself um and and that's the ultimate motivation because i got burned yeah i i think i mean based on what i've seen that is probably what will happen but like i said like i hope that we don't get the kind of i i i wish that we wouldn't have to go through the private eye type world uh or prelude where it starts off with this uh data breach catastrophe i think it's shitty but uh yeah i think that's unavoidable it's like people need to take that threat seriously to get motivated and it's just look at the world nowadays unless some threat actually directly presents itself to people personally they just don't take it seriously well the the scary thing is like i said even if we do have that kind of catastrophe we may have already had it and people are they're just i i feel like there yeah there's a certain threshold of threat that the average person will face from that and if it doesn't past the threshold of i need to care about this now and do something and change there even if you had that kind of catastrophe it might not even they might not do anything even then they're just going to be like well i'm not that i'm not that interesting i'm just i'm going to behave like an average person i'm not going to do anything that challenges power and i'm just going to let all of the other people who have the courage to do that take the fall for all of this well, if that's the case, then we have a problem, Houston. But I mean, it's it just is what it is, and yeah. On a completely random note, the other thing about Chase that pisses me off is that he still hasn't made a single fucking statement since this all fucking went mm-hmm. down. 
Yeah. So that, like have some integrity. Me. Like if you have even an ounce of integrity, stand behind your actions, man. Come on. Yeah, I mean, so I I know very little about Trace other than he's an investor and he was doing the um what's it called? Um the thing on January third. I can't even remember right now. Where you take your Bitcoin out of exchanges. Proof of keys. Yeah, proof. So I know that he does proof of keys, and he's an investor. But other than that, I've I've paid very little attention to him. So I'm probably like the effect on me of what he's been doing has been pretty minimal because uh, I've seen so many people do this kind of shit, even high profile people, that I've like stopped. I've stopped being disappointed. Like the the people that I know and trust well, I know that they won't do this kind of thing. I don't know whether he was that kind of person to you guys, but I just it doesn't affect me as much. He was somebody that I thought wouldn't go this low. But yeah, it's it's <laughs> I I just don't even know what to say, dude. I've spent so long in this space getting outraged when people do retarded things that I just feel numb inside when it, when it happens now. <laughs> As is tradition. Yeah, I guess, you know, kind of the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, regarding just the whole general political scene, I guess, of privacy in the world is the jurisdictional arbitrage um, potential. You know, if, say, Venezuela just spun up a server that would issue and transact anonymous digital e-cash right now um you know what's to stop anybody in the world from being able to just low-key use that and obscure their footprint over the internet like this kind of stuff it's you know i think a, a potential wild card here beyond just build peer-to-peer tools or try to make your legal battles that could really kind of change the the tone of the conversation with this stuff like that that's a whole different ball game when it's just up and running and it's uh i don't know go start another iraq war if you want to do something about it and you know there's already countries starting shit coins yeah i mean it's it's definitely a huge element to both the space and just um innovation on the internet in general right like this is a global uh network um, and it, it should be interesting to watch how all that game theory plays out. Um, also, just in terms of threat modeling, uh, network security in general, uh, it should, you know it should be interesting. I, I think it should all we're going to see this play out heavily in terms of lightning too. Um, so, yeah, it, it, we're on a like the, everything's going to be a little bit different going forward. So it should be interesting to watch. Yeah, that's another thing I even. I didn't even think to toss up in the, the notes I made for this. Um, you know, what, what what the hell do you think is going on with uh, Mnuchin's announcement that new regulation was coming? I mean, like, what is there? One, what is there left to, to clarify there? And two, what, what was up with FinCEN kind of commenting in response to that? Like, what? Like, we don't know what he's talking about. I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that the Trump administration is inept and preoccupied and um, that no real enforcement or hard regulation is going to going to happen anytime soon while he's still in office. Um, you know, it it was it was a presser. He likes talking a big game, so we'll see. Uh, we already knew he wasn't a fan, fan of Bitcoin, but uh you know, like what he went on with Joe Kern on CNBC and he told them that uh no money laundering happens with the U.S. dollar, like point blank, because Joe's a Bitcoiner now, so he asked him that question. Um, but yeah, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how it plays out. I've I, I've long held the belief that, um, regardless of the viewpoint on Trump, just the fact that he's so distracted with other things um, and so seemingly inept uh, that, in terms of Bitcoin, where Bitcoin was in its growth. Uh, it was it, it, it's a pretty big deal that he that he was elected uh, and that Bitcoin kind of got the pressure pulled off of it for for a little bit longer. 
how would you feel if they came out and pretty much declared lightning nodes money service businesses if you are routing something for another person yeah i mean this is why it's important that you can run a lightning node reliably over tor right and this is why it's important that we have um sizable numbers of not you know private users that haven't doxed themselves that aren't known identities that are running these things through tor who knows exactly uh, you know, so you want it geographically distributed because, you know, they might have compromised Tor. We, well, we, we don't really know, um, at least the U.S. government. But if they're geographically distributed, then we come back to that same situation as as we were at before, where, um, you know, th there is this uh, regulatory arbitrage at, at play. Uh, so, we'll, you know, the game theory there is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, I was Guys, about to say, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to cut you in half because I have to go. Uh, so I just want to say goodbye. Uh, like, subscribe, smash that like button. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> and, and, and thank you for listening. And thank you guys for the, today's episode. Uh, bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks sorry for your time. You couldn't stay, man. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it would suck if I couldn't run a, a lightning node to, to route and participate on the network in the United States, but um, we're just one out of like 200 something countries on this planet. Um, I don't really give a shit where the, the node routing my payment is. <laughs> as long as people can easily enter and run it relatively privately, um, it shouldn't be an issue, but that's, you know, that, that's the most important thing here. And that, you know, that's what we had this whole fucking scaling debate about too. So, um, cautiously optimistic there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure if that happens though, B cashers will have lots of fun with that one. I have left the red, white, and blue behind. So, uh, whatever crazy shit the U S wants to get up or more crazy shit, I should say that they want to get up to is not my problem. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. This is America. Do what the fuck I want. You say that now. I say that forever. But yeah. You know, I guess uh, I, I'm pretty much out of out of stuff to talk about. I think we kind of worked our way through the, the list I put together pretty thoroughly. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Thank you again for having me. Uh, as I said before, I've been listening to the show for years. So um, it's cool to finally join you guys. Uh, and just to all the listeners, you know, run your own node, coin join your funds. Uh, privacy is not inherently criminal. And don't forget to check uh, Matt out with his buddy Marty on Tales from the Crypt if you're one of the few idiots out there listening who doesn't. Yeah, come join us over there too. DFTC.io. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, I don't know. Is uh, any last, uh, you know, things either you guys want to bring up? Uh well, as usual, it's, I mean, not on topic, but uh, definitely pay attention to the extradition trial, or should I say opening of the extradition trial going on in London. Um, everyone everywhere should be paying attention to it, especially people in the UK, because the UK is uh, pulling some shit uh, regarding their interpretation of uh, whether they should follow international law or whether they're only beholden to uh, domestic law. They, yeah, they're kind of throwing everything up in the air. Um, the funniest thing that happened yesterday, well, not funny, it's kind of infuriating at the amount of incompetence here, but the judge, um, the, 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 the defense lawyer, uh, one of them brought up the fact that something they were discussing was uh, uncontested defense evidence. That's the term he used. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a judge and I know what uncontested defense evidence means. It means defense evidence that, you know, was submitted to court or discussed in court and it was not, you know, challenged in any way. It was acknowledged um, by both parties. And the judge had to ask what uncontested defense evidence means, which just blew my mind. It's amazing. So, yeah, there's a lot of crap going on there, and we need to pay attention because basically the UK government is very obviously flaunting the fact that it does not care about the rule of law, and we can't just let that slide.
Yeah, wow. Is it? <laughs> I oh, yeah. And another part. So, you know that whole thing, um, at least in the United States, where the defendant is not only, you know, allowed to participate in their own trial, like speak, but it's also important that they actually hear what people are saying. Like, they can hear what people are saying. Um, surprisingly, apparently, the UK, or at least this crazy uh, clusterfuck of a court, doesn't think it's important that Assange has been stuck in a bulletproof box this entire time in the back of the court, and the audio setup in this place is god-awful, and he cannot hear what people are saying most of the time. In fact, people in the public gallery cannot hear, and people in the public media room cannot hear. So, and they don't consider this to be a problem at the moment, and that is, like, mind-boggling. Can you imagine that you were put on trial and you cannot hear what anyone is saying? Like, that would be terrifying, and that is apparently acceptable. That's not a trial, that's torture. Fucked up. Yep, I mean, it's, uh, it's one more, uh, one more bit of torture on the giant pile of torture that he's already had to endure but it's just insane like it was it, it's so insane that the prosecution the like representatives for the u.s government were saying uh well no we actually don't have a problem with him being allowed to sit with his lawyer he doesn't have to file a bail application in order to sit next to his lawyers in his own trial that's a bit insane like that's how bad it is yeah, uh, it's fucked up. Well, I, as usual, don't really know how to respond after that. So, shit. I wish there was a more positive note to take us out on, but, uh, yeah, everybody should pay attention to that situation. And, uh, I hope you guys got something informative out of the rest of the show. So, uh, catch you later, punks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>